we have automated trading bots, which is basically taking all the stuff that I said we did. The bot literally buys the trade, sells it when it's time. If it's going against us, it'll stop and, and take us out. We now have years of data. We have a win rate in the system of 87 and percent. I love it. We say we guarantee to get you to a 70% win rate or you don't pay. And we very rarely give refunds. When you understand that money is just energy, this is really a hard one for people. Cause we usually when we're thinking about money, it's tight and I've been there. And it's, so it's hard to just believe that it could be this easy. But when you align your thoughts, your vibrations, your energy with what you want, it just comes to you. What's up everybody. Welcome back to gathering the Kings podcast. I am your host, Chaz Wolf. And today I am honored to bring Dan Rawich to the King stage. This guy is the absolute real deal. He's got 40 years of experience in the trading industry. Dan established the fourth largest mortgage credit reporting firm in the nation. Just a little bitty company called Datafax. Now, Dan operates now as the founder of the University of Options, where he runs the business with his daughters. He basically teaches live trading classes and has all other sorts of resources around trading and using AI to enable trading bots to make incredible returns. In this episode, we cover these three things plus more, guaranteed returns and what that really means, how AI bots really work, and mind control and how money is a form of energy. Subscribe and follow if you haven't already. Please like this video and comment down below if you agree that money is a form of energy. Grab your notebooks. Let's dive in. Dan, my man, welcome to the King stage. Thanks for being here. How are Thank you? Thank you so much. Good, good. Appreciate you having me. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. You know, I appreciate that. You said just right before we hit the record button that oftentimes it's a like, like, I'm introverted. I got to do a show, but you've got incredible knowledge that we are going to, you're going to sift out of you here today. So I appreciate you being here, being willing to share. You've got a background that's a little different than 450 guests that we've had on this show. And so, uh, you know, the, I just gave this incredible intro of, of who you are and a little bit about what you are coming to the table with, but I want to know why have you landed here? Like what's so important or what's so powerful in your mind about trading about you know moving money like just this vein of how you've done life in the last little bit and been successful at it why is that your thing like why do you feel like you resonate with it so much so um you know you and i brief briefly spoke about this and we do have the same sort of coach's heart and it really feels good to make a difference in, in people's lives i know that gets overset and overused yeah it is absolutely what drives me and it drives me every day so that's part of it and then the other part is is why this Let's see if I can shorten this story. But in 1978, sophomore in college, long time ago, yeah, well before you were born, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a job as a loan officer in the mortgage industry. That also is a long story because nobody wanted to hire me. I was 19 years old. Yeah. I tried fake glasses. I tried actually putting gray in my hair. Wow. That turned purple though because they had to bleach it to try to make it gray. So then you just look like that, a rock star. Exactly. <laughs> so I finally found someone after 12 interviews that would give me a shot. Wow. And just after I started, I asked her, where do we get our money? Because we're not a bank. I don't understand. Who, who, some rich guy owned the company? She said, no, we have a really giant line of credit, you know, in the tens of millions. And then when all you guys on the street make these loans, we pull them together and then we sell them off on Wall Street. Yeah. And I said, there's a guy that does what I do, but in the tens of millions, that, that just really sounded cool to me and New York and all that stuff. And yeah. it just became a massive goal for mine, for me. And so it came true, you know, it took, it took some work, but after college, I was recruited by Bear Stearns and I became a bond trader on wall street. And even after 40 years, it's probably still the best job I ever had, but it was also terrible because if you watch Wolf of wall street, oh yeah, it's. It's kind of true. Like in the eighties, yeah. you know, the firm put us up in really great places for the first year or so till we could find a place. And so there were other guys, you know, most of them graduated from really big Ivy league schools and I didn't, <laughs> but the, these guys were snorting Coke in the limo on the way to the office pretty much yeah. every day. And uh, it just crude and rude and foul language. And I'm not a choir boy, I promise, but I, I just, none of it ever really resonated with me. 
but the job itself, I just loved. Yeah. What, I mean, the, there's so much in there. <clears throat> First off, I worked for a sales organization. I always felt like it was the, the like minor version of, of that movie. And it was just like, you know, no, things mm -hmm. were really, <laughs> it was really that crazy in a sales environment, but even more so I'm sure on wall street, when things like that were actually happening, I'm curious in that little brief that you gave me, it's 1978 and you're 19 years old or right, right about there. And, and you have to interview multiple times to get this, to get this deal. I remember being 19 and being told that nobody buys life insurance from a 19 year old. And I said, okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Thanks. Oh. Shake your hand. And I'm going to go sell a bunch of life insurance. And Similar. so, yeah, what, what was in that for you? Like, what was the burn? And like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to accept no as an answer to this interview. I'm going to go get another one and another one until you were able to achieve it. What, what, what pushed you? So, so the first half of that is coincidence, fate, whatever you want to call it, which I kind of don't believe in. But my sister, my older sister, who, who at that time was my hero, she came home one time in a really fancy sports car. She and I were roommates when I was in college. She didn't go to college. Yeah. And I'm like, how did you get this car? Because <laughs> you know, she was a bank teller. So nice. she explained to me that they moved her into the loan department and that she got commissions every time that she made a loan. And I was like, you are actually getting paid for giving people money? That's, that's amazing. <laughs> and it just really hit me. So the first place I went to was her boss. And he said, I really like you. I feel like you could do this. I just can't get through your age. He, he said, I know you're 19, but you look like you're 15. Yeah. And so, and that was true. So I, I just, I just wanted to do it. I wanted a nice car like her <laughs> and I didn't want to work at Burger King where honestly, a lot of my friends work and there's nothing wrong with that. I promise. I just you wanted didn't more. want to do it. So yeah. just kept going and going and going. And I think everywhere along the way, even the interviewers that turned me down said something that was encouraging. And, you know, me being an optimist, I just kept locking into the good part. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that, that you're right. The optimist holds on to any last little thread, right? It's like, yeah, no, this is truth. He said this about me. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, kind of fast forward and you, you said you have a coach's heart. And now you help people not only just make money, but, but you give them structure and there's courses and all kinds of stuff that you guys are, are, are doing, but you have this tagline that I want to dive right into, which is basically a guaranteed way to make returns, how to invest in 2024 and make guaranteed returns. And with this looming, you know, economy transition, there's all, there's doom and gloom, there's optimism, there's all this stuff happening in the news and on TikTok. What, what says you about guaranteed returns in 2024? Give us this construct here. Yeah. Okay. So I, I won't give all the disclaimers, but I should just when talking about guarantee returns, totally. all that stuff. Yeah. So we'll just go in. So there's two things we do. One is we teach people how to trade options, stock options. And to put this in perspective, for the first time in history, there are more options traded than actual shares of stock. Wow. It's never happened before. So, and it has a lot to do with the whole 2020 Wall Street bet guys, you know, they, they, they just kind of came in and, and they did change the industry. So we teach people how to do that. It's, to me, it's not difficult. What I tell people, the learning curve is steep, but it's short. It's mm. like climbing your driveway, not climbing a mountain. Because people really, especially when you get older, you, you do feel this overwhelmed sense when you have to learn something new because yeah. we have, most of us have forgotten how to learn. So that's where it starts, a really extensive course. And then the saying in our organization is slow is fast because any t every time we've had somebody come into the program with, with too much ego, too much whatever, they struggle. And so I realized this is like the tortoise and the hare. I don't know if that was a story when you were a kid, oh, yeah. but so, and you know, the tortoise always wins every yeah. time because the rabbit's cocky. He's overconfident. He doesn't prep. Um, he doesn't take it seriously enough. And so we tell people to start really slow paper trade, show me your results or show one of our traders your results before you start trading real money. And we always hear, have these guys say, I've got whatever money, I don't need to do that. I said, you do need to do that. You'll just blow up bigger than the guy that has less. Yeah. So that that's made a huge difference. And then we tell people, don't gear up. Don't raise the amount that you're trading unless it's with the house's money. 
don't gear up with your own capital. It's just foolish. If you're not making enough money to gear up your trading activities, you're not ready to be gearing up. So we're really confident about our system. And we, I developed an indicator called Flight Station, which in some ways is my life's work. It's a long story. And it was almost like, like if you ask me how I did it, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, it was years and years of just trial and error and tr just believing that there was something that could really help. Yeah. And, and I remember one day our, our developer said, what if you did this? And he explained something. I was like, that's really smart. Let's do that. And, and he did that. And it was way better than anything we'd seen. And I said, let's, let's do it this way now. And then all of a sudden we looked at the chart and we looked at the indicators. And every time just before the price went up, the indicator said buy. And every time before the price went down, the indicator said sell. And, you know, we now have years of data. We have a win rate in the system of 87 and a half percent. I love it. If you, if you see, saw our ads, we say we guarantee to get you to a 70% win rate or you don't pay. And wow. we very rarely give refunds. Usually it's because somebody didn't apply themselves. Yeah. So that's that. And the other half of the business is we have automa automated trading bots, which is basically taking all the stuff that I said we did and automating the code, yeah. creating an algorithm around it, and then, and then telling the bot, to, to trade. When you see this happen, go in and execute the trade. The bot literally buys the trade, sells it when it's time. If it's going against us, it'll stop and, and take us out. So yeah. that we have years and years of data. Again, the SEC doesn't really let us say guaranteed, yeah. nor does FINRA, but, but the fact is we will guarantee that you'll have this result or you won't pay. I had a guy, he's a real good member. He's one of our options trading members and he bought two bots when we rolled out and he sent me this note yesterday and he, and he said, things just got crazy in my life. I haven't really had time to use the bots. I never set an appointment to, to use them. And I don't know, is this something you could buy back? Is this something? And I was so impressed that he did just come say, I want a refund. It didn't work because most people will fib their way through it. Not most, a lot. Yeah. And so I said, if you're not using it, then it's the way I look at it, you, the guarantee applies to you. You didn't get the result. It's your fault, but still. So yeah. we refunded him. Well, that's just integrity. I appreciate you sharing that. I think that most people actually, at least business owners that I'm in contact with, high level thinkers actually do this very same thing that you're talking about. And because at the end of the day, uh, a negative ripple, it's not worth it. And so I, I appreciate your, your perspective on that. The AI piece here. I mean, you you opened up the can, so let's 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 just take a further dive into that. I mean, you've been you know creating ways to collect data and and track charts and all this stuff that you've been collecting, and then you put it into automations, and then here comes AI, and which is like mm -hmm. automations on steroids, and you're building bots or agents that can do things things on on your behalf now, mm -hmm. where a human connectivity is is this much needed, obviously high level is still needed, but, but mm -hmm. less. Talk about how this right. has revolutionized uh, the industry for you or for, or for your people that are trading. Yeah. So, so one thing a lot of people don't realize is there's really two fundamental types of AI. One of them is really just an algorithm, you know, write the code, have it do this. Uh, AI has made that easier. Um, it's, it's really uh, relieved a lot of the coding needs. I'm sure you know this chat GBT. I could literally say, as long as you know the prompts. Right. And I argue with her all the time. I, she's, a, she's a girl. So <laughs> I, I, she'll say, I can't, as a language-based AI, I cannot do this. And I say, right. okay, just pretend you're not a language-based AI. <laughs> pretend you're actually a trader. Oh, well, if I were a trader, I would do it this way. Yep. And you have to just keep feeding her the information. I'm sure a lot of people know that. But that's, that's more, the more simple part of AI that's made the creation easier. Yeah. Um, and then you have neural networks and these are, this is AI, this is like Terminator stuff. A neural network can think and get smarter. So if it makes a bad trading decision, it learns from it. And there's millions of different nuances that a human mind could, I don't think a human mind could ever really conceive all this. And for AI, it's just, you know, it's an everyday thing. I won't do that again, but it's not just saying I failed. It's saying I failed and is going back and finding thousands of data points as to why I failed. 
Yeah. So neural networks are are really fascinating uh, for me. And they're not new. When I was running Finet, we talked about that. We developed a fair amount of technology. And I remember, this was like 1998, maybe, this really fascinating guy from Germany. English was a little rough, but he, he was just a brilliant guy, MIT graduated. And he told us that at these really sophisticated experimental places, this is bizarre, but back then, they had created these silicon chips that could swim and create themselves. Wow. So they were actually having chips create chips 30 years ago. And it, that goes just to crazy places. But we ended up being on Fannie Mae, which most people know who Fannie Mae is, I would think, their technology council. And we helped develop the very first version, which, was, which is desktop underwriter. We had a virtual server going into Fannie Mae. And that is the first time I really said, whoa, because now you take an underwriting system that learns from its mistakes. So if yeah. a loan, it, you keep feeding the data. If two years from now that loan goes bad, it registers that. It goes back to see how, how could this have been fixed. And it's gotten smarter and smarter over the years. Yeah. I mean, you have this idea. I had a guy on the show probably maybe two or three months ago, and he was talking about they build AI agents. And <clears throat> this is the technology that's here. He was like, this is not coming. It's here. And, mm -hmm. and in essence, what you're describing is that rather than having a human be able to, you know, of course, learn and, and grow and be better, the AI just is light years ahead because it can categorize and catalog all the past mistakes and then make better and better decisions at a faster rate. And then eventually, as you already said, those agents then learn how to build other agents. <laughs> And it's a multiplication yeah. factor of like, uh oh, you know, and I think you can kind of get a little doom and gloom and a little scared there, but. Well, yeah, you should. <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. When you really dissect that also means a big opportunity because things are, things are headed that way. So we can't be scared, sure. put our head in the sand, but at the same time, yeah. Like, what does that really mean? Okay. So for the, for the trader who's, or listening right now, somebody who's maybe dabbled, maybe no trading experience whatsoever. What's their takeaway from AI and, and maybe possibly working with a company like yours? Like, how is it affecting? It's obviously making it more efficient. It's making it easier to make good decisions. Like, what's their, like, their takeaway here on this? You know, I think the average person, believe it or not, doesn't come into our program talking about AI, thinking about AI. You know, they've heard something about it. They're skeptical when you say, well, we our bots use AI to, to yeah. trade. It's a little much for, for people to grasp. And that's why, again, I, I'm not selling, I promise. It, but we say, look, just dry it. Just use the bot for 30, 60, 90 days. We'll even hook it up to a demo account. So you have no risk of buying the bot and you have no risk of using the bot. And just get to know it. You'll realize that it has a personality and, and it'll work for you. Yeah, I love everything that you just said because it makes it real. I've been in and out, not necessarily of trading like you do, but the crypto space in the last five years. And there's bots, right? And it's like, yeah. anytime that that came up in a conversation, I was like, skirt, run the other way. <laughs> and not because of the technology, but because of just most likely the, the person that hype. was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. and just unbelievable returns. And it doesn't mean that the technology is not there. Obviously, you're saying that it is, which I've known. It's the who's handling it and where did it come from and that type of a thing. So I love everything. I'm pointing this out for the listeners that. What you just heard Dan say is not only demo account and try it out and see how it works, but it is it is real. So go 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 take a look here. I think this is incredible. Just to your point, sorry, no, on, no, no. on the whole crypto space, I, I would say bots probably were born in the crypto space. The crypto space brought so much intellect. Unfortunately, with it came the hype and the snake oil and all that stuff. Yeah. But but if you look beneath that, the technology and, and some of the systems that came from crypto I think will change the whole trading world. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that you're on the cutting edge of that, obviously, in your space. The reality of it is, is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to change all industries eventually. What do you think in this, like looking back, you've had just uber success. We haven't even gone really into your, your, your backdrop. You kind of mentioned some previous companies that you'd sold and stuff like that. But what do you think looking back in your history is this sticking point of like, when I did this, it was like, Oh, bad moment, but maybe it was like a, a hinge for the rest of your success. But what's that moment you stick out? You're just like, oh, if I hadn't have done this. 
Yeah. So I had this crazy, great, unusual experience while in college, while trying to get that job uh, as a loan officer, I belonged to the college's marketing club and I kind of rose to an executive level within the college marketing club. And Jim Rohn came and spoke to us wow. and he said something during his speech. He said, and, Ron, and I told you earlier, I am fundamentally an introvert. This was big for me. So Jim said while he was speaking that poor people should buy rich people dinner, you know, instead of looking for a handout, you know, take somebody that's wealthy to dinner, watch how they shake hands, watch how they look you in your eyes, ask them questions and you'll get more from that than anything. And so after he finished his speech, I remember thinking, you know, you could do this, you could do this. And he was like packing up his stuff and everything. And he was famous, but nothing like, you know, he, he, he was in the end. And I said, you know, you mentioned that poor people should, you know, and, and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, are you asking me to lunch? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, in all the years I've done this, no one's ever come up and done what you just did. Yeah. And so I, I went to work for him. And I worked for him for the whole, whatever it was, maybe eight or 10 months while I was trying to get that loan officer job. And I learned more from that guy than, than, than any other person could ever teach me. And one of the things that Jim said, and, and I think a lot of people have heard him say this, but he said it directly to me that he said, let's talk about your library. Let's talk about, you know, what's in your library. And you have to pinky swear to me that you'll read for 30 minutes every night until you reach, you know, the, the highest possible pinnacle. And I said, okay. And he said, start with think and grow rich, which, you know, is a classic and uh, psycho cybernetics, which was just really coming out. And he spoke a lot about Silva mind control, Jose Silva. I don't know if you guys have talked about that much on your show. But one thing I just have to say, I recently gave a speech in Vegas and uh, I did some research because I'm really big on silver mind control. I, I have stories that will blow people's mind. Did I just lose my train of thought? Yeah. So it's okay. Right. You're in Vegas. Yeah. So I, I, I did some research for the talk. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah no worries. I really wasn't sure where I was going to take this. And in researching, I started seeing these headlines of a woman named Helen Hadsel who was connected to Jose Silva, ultimately her bookkeeper. And she won the lottery over 2000 times. She won every contest she, she ever entered. She won a house for her family. It got to the point where she would say to her children, okay, who's next? What do you want? I want a pink bike. And she would just look for a contest that maybe had a bike or something. And that all came down to actually Silva mind control. You know, the CIA uses this technology. And it's unbelievably easy to, to put to use in your, in your life. But those two books that Jim Rohn told me to read put me on that whole path of, of Silva Mind Control. So I had a huge, huge advantage there. I, one other small, no, not small, big advantage I had, but small in comparison. My dad was a classic entrepreneur, and, but he taught me how to fail more than he taught me how to succeed. And he was just like... I remember one day we were living in, in my mind, it was like a mansion. I'm sure it wasn't. It was probably just a big house. And my dad had this big daddy horse, Cadillac, Eldorado, turquoise with white leather, convertible, white top. Yeah. And man, the kids, we loved that car. Then one day he came home in this old Rambler, honest to God, it was dragging one, dr the tailpipe. And he, I said, dad, where's the Cadillac? And he's like, "Never mind." We're moving. We are. <laughs> and the next day we moved from that house, which many years later found out it was foreclosed on. And he said, we're moving to the desert. And we moved to this small town of Lancaster, which was pretty rough. And we lived in this very small, maybe thousand square foot home. And I say that small, there were three of us coming out of a much bigger home. And within three years, my dad was mayor of the town, opened the very first McDonald's owned the biggest real estate firm in the town and owned the drive-in. But then he, he, was, he was best friends with Don Imus, you know, the famous disc jockey. And Don was the DJ of this little tiny radio station in Lancaster called KUTY. He was a nut. 
I mean, I'm not surprised he went on to be who he was. He got fired from every job he ever had because he just couldn't contain himself. But they, they got in a match fight. And they, they, they burned down the drive-in theater because it had this big snack bar kind of thing. Yeah. And then some other stuff happened. You know, he may have been an herbal pioneer. So next thing I know, we're moving, we're moving to Northern California. Wow. And he took a job literally just selling insurance. And same story, just over the years, just bigger and bigger and bigger. So he never seemed to care if we failed. I, I wish I had that. I have failed more than once, but it, it hurts. It hurt my heart. I remember one time literally just going to the bathroom and just crying, like, like, oh my God, what have I done with my kids? But then when I look back, every time anything like that's happened, I've just catapulted. Yeah. I think Tony Robbins said, bottom's a great springboard. And it really is. You're not going to spring up huge from the middle. It's usually from, from the bottom. Wow. So Jim Rohn and, and just watching my dad, th those were huge, huge things for me. Hey, Kings and Queens, Jazz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again, <laughs> all of the things on social media, on all the different platforms, or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other grow. Yeah, I think that you just gave so much information that I could interview you for the next three hours. And... <laughs> And between Jim and between, you know, the mind control, your dad, it sounds like he was an interesting fellow for sure. What do you think, you know, the, as I mean, cause you didn't go in any of those directions. I mean, kind of, but, but different. You, you went, you know, wall street and, and finance and now trading. And did, did that like the entrepreneurial journey that you said your dad was on this, like fail, achieve bigger, fail, achieve bigger. Is that what pushed you? there or was it more of just kind of what you said at the beginning of just wanting the nice car and just figuring out how to sell loans and and do the thing like how do you think you ended up there is my question so the books had a lot to do with it the, the books make you realize that almost anything is possible and this is maybe a little woo woo out there you can choose to edit it or not but there are things we cannot see we can understand energy is in everything every single thing we know is built on energy and energy absolutely has a vibration. It's always going somewhere. It's, it's the protons and neutrons, you know, coming back and forth to one another. And I could look inside of a rock and it would look just like the, the, an acorn that was going to be a mighty oak tree. And when you understand that money is just energy, this is really a hard one for people because we usually, when we're thinking about money, it's tight and I've been there and it's, so it's hard to just believe that it could be this easy, but when you align your thoughts, your vibrations, your energy with what you want, it's, it's just going to, it just comes to you. It, it was almost effortlessly. I used to think when I was a kid and I wrote a book and I talk about this in my book, that one of the reasons I went from rags to riches is I felt like God had something to do with whether I succeeded or not. And I decided that every time I got too much money, that maybe I got greedy. And so God would say, and then I thought that only good people could succeed. And then at a young age, I had a business partner, partner who was an absolute horrible guy. We were partners for a long time and I watched him and he, he developed wealth 10 times anything I've ever done. And he really is a schmuck. And then I realized it has nothing to do with being a good or, good or bad person. As much as I hate to say that, That's you right. want to believe that, but it's not. It's yeah. just that Rob was 100% tuned into money and everything he did, it just, it just came to him. Yeah. So when you can get your mind around that one, it's yeah. amazing how fast things will go. And th those things come from Think and Grow Rich, Silver Mind Control and Psycho Cybernetics. All yeah. those books talk about it. Yeah, I love, I love that. I'm a, I'm a deep student of Think and Grow Rich and, and further books as well, but you're right. It's so funny, this conversation, because I, I also am a man of faith, but the, 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 the rub where 
you know, the opportunity came because I was good or because I followed the rules or because I received a blessing. And it's like, well, actually, I can find, like you said, not righteous <laughs> people <laughs> winning like big. And and actually, there's there's scripture that talks about how he reigns on the just and the unjust alike. And so if we know that to be true, well, what is it then? And to your point, it's the be tuned in. I like to say that I'm I'm not the creator, but he made me in his image to create. And and so if I yeah. understand frequency, like you're talking about, look, let's create. And 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 if I'm waiting for someone else to create, to your point, nothing comes to me. Right? Would you agree with that? Oh, a hundred percent. I you know, I love that. And, you know, I don't want to maybe overdo the religious path, but I think you and I have a lot in common there. Yeah. We were put here to create so he could watch us base to simplify it. Yeah. Like it, it's go, Dan, go, you know? And so instead of thinking like, oh, he's going to get mad at me because I want too much. It's more like, oh my God, he's my biggest cheerleader. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I want to do this for him and for me, Yeah. but just to be clear, and I know you're okay with this. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to believe in God or anything. I hate to say this, but you can win really big lining your energy with money. Yeah. No one's going to take it away from you. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that the, the piece there that you're talking about as far as him being your biggest cheerleader is the father's heart. So now we can go actually back into religion a little bit, or at least what I call relationship, not, not so much re religion. But if I have a son, I have daughters too, but when my four-year-old son Shoot, I mean, he's been shooting his bow for about a year, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. But he, he goes outside and he's shooting his bow. And when he hits that target spot right on, I'm like, yeah, dude, that's my man. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just so proud of him. And I'm, and I'm proud of my daughters when they create new things. My oldest is such a creator. She like forms things out of art. It's just incredible. And I'm not like in there telling her, no, don't do this. Don't, you know, I'm not controlling any of it. I'm just watching her create this thing out of cardboard. And my mind is blown. I'm like, wow, you, that is beautiful. You're beautiful. And this whole thing is incredible. And so I think that's the perspective that you and I are trying to portray here. It's like, no, actually, that's the part that we get to partake in as like a, like a, you know, I guess the glory of it, right? Cause, cause the other is going to happen no matter what, regardless of our, our faith beliefs. It's more of a belief in this is how things work because this is how things are actually designed in, in the earth, you know, with frequency, with protons, right. neutrons. like this, this is just facts, you know? Right. Why, why do you think most people, because it is facts. It, I mean, you want to say science that, I mean, whatever, these are real things that we're talking about. It's happened in my life. It's happened in yours. And I've, t I talk to people about this all the time and I sound like you do as well. What do you think is hard for the listener right now for them to go, okay, I'm going to go all in on mind control or think and grow rich or aligning my mind with how frequency works. What, what's the hardest part for them to be able to grasp onto? So a lot of people, I'd say probably most people live hand to mouth. You know, I, I, I've, I've been there. I have uh, three millennial kids and I watch how tough it is for them. You know, I try to help them as much as I can. But my oldest daughter said to me one time, dad, I love everything you've ever done for me. You've made my life so easy, but you forgot to teach me how to hunt. And I'm scared every day because you'll be gone someday and I don't know how to hunt for myself. So, so I just wanted to get that out there. I love that you're encouraging your kids that way because you're, you'll create something much greater than you, which is the idea. I, on the other hand, my dad always told me nothing comes easy. Nice guys finish last. And then I used to say, dad, I'm going to, I'm going to be rich. I said, since I was a kid, he goes, really, what are you going to do? And well, no. he's like, well, you're delusional. And it turns out that that was the biggest compliment he ever gave me. You know, it, it, being delusional is a powerful thing. I don't think anything would get invented if you didn't have somebody delusional behind the invention. So, yeah. so thanks for that, dad. But I think because people are hand to mouth, they, it's really hard to think spiritually. It's really hard to think about money being energy. It, yeah. Plus you've been told your whole life that that's a bunch of, you know, just mumble jumbo, don't believe it. And just a quick example. So recently one of our members came to me and I really barely know this guy. I mean, I know most of their names just because we live trade with our members. So I see them in the trading room and we chat and stuff and. This guy asked me to borrow a fairly large sum of money 
And he told me that, you know, he was about to lose everything and be homeless. And it was really sad. And so I started talking to him about the stuff you and I are talking about, just being stupid at that time. And he actually said to me very politely, can we talk about this stuff later? Because I can't understand a word you're saying. I just need to know if you're going to loan me the money. And I, unfortunately, I think that that defines a lot of people. But once you could let go of that, it, it, it's amazing. It, yeah. it really is. Yeah, that that block, right, is that I can't quite get to where you are because my apparent need is so big, right, right here in front of my nose, which even that is a limiting belief. Like that need, yes, he was maybe going to lose everything, but but as you said earlier, maybe that was the spring, the bottom springboard that he needed. Yeah, I could have helped him out. I really do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you had mentioned there with you chatting with your 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 daughters. I know your daughters are in your business, and so I want to talk about the dynamic here of working with them, but also obviously you're teaching them how to hunt now if they're in the business, but talk about this dynamic of maybe how it was and then how it is now, if you're teaching them how to hunt, how it is in business with your daughters, like just give us a little peek. What that, what that look like? Oh yeah. That's one of the, my, my greatest joys of the business is my youngest daughter. So my youngest daughter is the daughter of, of mine and my wife's and we've been married forever. She's 20 five now. And so she's had full unfiltered me and my wife has exactly the same beliefs. So there's almost no way she wasn't going to do something well. Yeah. The other daughter that's in the business really struggles with these limiting beliefs, but she knows it. Yeah. She's constantly saying, dad, give me something else to listen to. I, I feel, I still feel blocked. I, so she doesn't talk anymore about her struggles or what she knew or didn't know. She knows that she needs to just get this energy clear. Yep. But my younger daughter lives on my property. We have, you know, a fair amount of acreage and we have a guest house sort of up in the trees and she lives in that. And so we have dinner together almost every single day. Wow. And some people would say this isn't a good thing, but our dinners are literally just company meetings. Yeah. Um, and so, so because we both love the business, it's fun. And my wife loves to contribute just by listening. So it's, it's, it's so special. I, I can't even tell you. I mean, every single day I get to, you know, connect with her and talk about things. And she's turned out to, she never knew anything about Facebook ads. She never knew anything about managing social media, anything. And I just sort of threw her into this and where she's gone with this, you'll have an appreciation for this, but she'll say, dad, we got to go to the recruiting studio because I don't like how this sounded. Or I'm worried about the statement because as you said, the FTC is starting to crack down. We got to be more careful. Yeah. We have to drive all the way to Sacramento, which is two and a half hour drive to the nearest studio. And everything's organized, the scripts and, and I'm talking and she's, I'm looking and she's like, she's 25 years old, you know, right. and she's completely driving me and, and all of our advertising. So yeah, it, 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 it's amazing. And I feel like now my older daughter is getting more and more uh, entrenched in, in these um, easier beliefs. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, because obviously you've got a kind of two tails here of, of your daughters, which I think is just a beautiful picture that you've given for both, actually. For the listener, what is the, the roadmap, especially for ones that have young kids? What's the roadmap for this level of integration? Maybe they're not 25 and working in the listener's business right now, but maybe they're like mine where I've got little kids but I want them maybe one day to be in the business or to do their own thing, whatever works. But the mind integration is what I'm talking about. How did, how did you do that piece of it with your both daughters, actually? Yeah. So Ashley, my oldest, said those words that I didn't teach her to hunt while Audrey, my youngest, was, was very small, like three or four. And, and it made me realize that I resented my dad because he, he never really gave us much other than knowledge. In fact, I remember at six years old, he bought me a bike. Now it was a cool bike. It was called a Varum. And when, when you drove it, it sounded like a motorcycle. Yeah. And it looked like a motorcycle. And my dad said, take care of it because it's the last one you're ever going to get. Wow. Well, that's a tough thing to say to a six-year-old, you know? Yeah. So that drove me to selling greeting cards door to door when I was eight years old. Wow. And I didn't win one bike. I won two bikes. And then I won a trip to Disneyland and I ended up bringing my dad into that business basically as like a crew manager. Yeah. So don't take, don't feel like you got to make things so easy for your kids because maybe your dad didn't make it easy for you. 
Yeah. I'm convinced I wouldn't be where I was right now if my dad wasn't a tightwad. I, I just know it. And yet I wanted to take all that struggle away from my daughters. Why? Now, now they can't be who I am because their path was, was maybe a little too easy. Yeah. And Audrey, the youngest, has watched all this happen, you know, and just said, I, I'm not going to go in that direction. But a couple of things that I learned, one is, and my, my, one of my daughters said this, because like you, your, your daughters are beautiful. They're like, you can't even imagine, how, how did you get the very best that I have and that your mom has? It's amazing. But uh, my middle daughter said, dad, don't tell Audrey she's beautiful every day. Tell her, tell her her mind is beautiful. Tell her what she did was beautiful. Like you said, when she's creating with Christ, that's amazing. Because looks can go away. Something could happen. Maybe I could get fat and, and I'm going to feel beautiful. And yet you've told me I'm beautiful. So just don't make it about looks. And that, that was hard for me. Because they told me every day, you guys are so gorgeous. And I still say it, but, but I make sure that I give a lot more of the other side. That um, it's like, you know, the actual building blocks of a human, right? And th this scenario of how do we as successful entrepreneurs, I've had this conversation with many, many other people, but how do we take the circumstances that made us who we are? And naturally, our kid's life is not going to be like ours. I mean, I grew up single mom family. So the fact that I'm in my kid's life makes it different, right? Yeah. And so, okay, what does that mean for, for their outcome? How do I help them be the best version of themselves by simulating <laughs> some of these hard things that I had to go through, but without having them actually to go through it. And so I appreciate you sharing that. What do you think, what do you think they would say? Give me, give me both daughters. Like if they were both right here on the pod and, and I would say, Hey, what's your thought on what you've been through and maybe what you're after now, what would their response be? I think pretty much what, what Ashley already told me is I love you so much. You made my life so easy growing up and now I don't know how to hunt. You know, we've helped her more than she ever wanted to ask for help. And she's not an entitled kid. She's, it's hard for to ask for anything. Usually it's myself or my wife will notice, like we saw on Facebook, selling some, some flooring that they didn't use. And the little things like that, you're like, I think, I think maybe things are tight because her husband works outside. He, he has a business where it's a cement pump. Oh, and when the weather's bad, it's tough. Yep. So we know this. And so we'll, I'll come up with things because I can't just offer her money anymore. She won't take it. She just won't. She goes, dad, if you saw the list of, of, of loans you've given me, it's, it's overwhelming. So, but we'll figure out something like, man, the social media piece of the business is really getting neglected. We're just too busy. So I'll call her up and I'll say, and she said, you really need this? Or are you just giving it to me? Like, if I didn't say yes, would you be hiring somebody? I swear I'd be hiring somebody. That's what it takes, you know, now to help her and give her money. And sh she came up with that by herself. Yeah. And I can't fool her. I can't just say, yeah, we need this, you know, done. She, she, she would say, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think the beauty of that, to your point, is that she, she wants to earn it for herself, which is, which is honorable, I think. Yeah. So we essence, did something she, right. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, she's saying, don't rob me of this, right? Which we, we do that with a silver spoon. What do you think your younger would say? Well, she's pretty much said this through her life is, I love my sisters so much that you wouldn't know they're from different moms. They're, they're just one family. But, but the age difference between the youngest and the oldest is like 15 years. But they're still like that. And she would say, I love my sisters. I wish I... You know, little things like a little, I wish I were as beautiful. I wish I were smart, but I don't want to be like them, dad. I, I, I don't want you to give me things. I don't want you to do things. And I don't know if this is good or bad. And maybe some parents will hate me for this, but one of the mistakes that I believe was this absolute insistence that they would go to college. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure that helped them. I, if I could have handed them each the hundred or hundred twenty thousand dollars and showed them how to invest it, yep. they it would be amazing. But instead, I just had this belief that kids go to college, and some of it was just that time, you know. Yep. And yep. over the years, that's changed. And Audrey said, "Would you be upset if I don't go to college? Because I think I could learn more 
just watching you and following you. And I said, I'm whatever you want. I'm fine with that. So it, it put her way ahead. And so basically yeah. in a polite way, she wanted to do everything that they didn't do. She wanted to do everything sure. different. Yeah. Which is, which is cool to be able to say, because you kind of already said like you did it for your older and now she's realizing like, Oh no, like bummer, but it's not too late. I mean, geez, there's so much life yeah. still to live and she can, and her husband can go. 68. She's 39. Yeah. 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 So much life. Um, so well, that's, that's incredible. Um, okay. Last little piece here. We're going to roll back the clock and we're talking to the younger Dan. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how old he is, but in your mind, you've got a picture. Is he good looking? You, he's, he's, he's fantastic looking. Um, very similar to, <laughs> to this Dan that I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> now I know you're lying. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you tap him on his shoulder and you whisper in his ear. What do you tell him? I don't have to tell him don't give up because he, he's not a quitter. But what I do have to tell him is don't lose faith. No matter what's going on in your life, do not lose faith because something great is going to come of this. And when you tell someone that's going through a tough time that don't worry, you're going to come out of this fine. They don't, can't hear it. They don't believe it. They, they don't even want to hear it. But the fact yeah. is it is 100% accurate. If you trust in this stuff that we're talking about, you're always going to come, come through it. And just a quick story there, I think it was 2009, maybe right after the meltdown, the things were really tough and we lost a lot. We were heavily invested in, in real estate projects in Mexico. And they say when California gets a cold, Mexico gets pneumonia. And she and I were walking, we didn't live in this neighborhood. It was a beautiful neighborhood called Corona Del Mar, which is part of Newport Beach, which is just so quaint and beautiful. And we were walking down the street and I said, you know, it's a shame. We'll never live in a place like this. This is the first time she really, really got mad at me. Like she was visibly angry. And she's like, how can you say that? And no, 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 that goes against everything you've ever taught, everything you believe. What the hell? And so four years later, we were living in that neighborhood, not yeah. quite that street, but two streets over. And I, if you asked me during that time, when I'm literally thinking about, you know, hand to mouth, that I would be living in a neighborhood like that in just a few years, I would not have believed you. Yeah. 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 I like to say everything you want uh, can be found in another, another person, a relationship. And, uh, that's probably uh, true in your life as well. Um, okay, well, the listener is anxious uh, to connect with you. You obviously have a mind that's out of this world, um, but also they might be interested in trading. They might be interested in maybe joining your program and figuring out how they can put money to work. Uh, how can they find you? So I think the best way is just to write through my email, dan at universityofoptions.com. You know, we have people that help me there. We have AI that helps me. But when I see something like this, like I heard, I heard you on the King's pod, I'm going to answer you. I promise. I'm going to want to know you and know your story and know how you got here. That's the best way. I actually love to see those messages. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you heard him straight from the, from the mouth there. Find the information in the show notes and connect with Dan and he'll take extra care of you because you're uh, listening here to Gathering the Kings. Dan, you are someone that, that I want to get to know and I hope the listeners do as well, but You've got just a wealth of knowledge, and I appreciate your time and just sharing of all those experiences. Uh, blessings to you, your family, your business, everything you're putting your hands to, all those people that you're helping to. Thanks for being here, brother. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together one thousand kings specifically who are grateful but not done we're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business family and communities and here's what we believe that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy so if that relates and and resonates with you and you know that you need people around you sharp qualified 
other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.